Lauren Stump was the featured artist in 2007. Uh, here's a piece called Samurai. With Lauren's work, we have a tremendous uh, pushing of the material into new territory of realism and the studies of lifelike uh, details. There's a little bit of an uh, uh, increased view, increased focus on detail. This is um, taking the art of flame working into uh, extremes, extremes of technique and realism. Um, Lauren began uh, working as a stained glass artist and he moved over to flame in the uh, early 90s and really has devoted himself entirely to this medium and has become a very important teacher. He travels the world and spends half of his time in other places helping to share the technical skills he's developed. Uh, this is a piece obviously um, devoted to uh, the great classic artwork and shows no shortage of ambition or fear to uh, show a famous work by Michelangelo David. Um, unlike the chiseled marble, there's a little bit of an issue with the definition where you're trying to create the face that's so well known in flame working, it comes very, very close. So obviously it's a different process. It's not gonna have the same exact impact, but we do zoom in on the hand just to show the kind of attention, the kind of time, the kind of work that Lauren pours into this, where we see the veins being realized. We're seeing the modeled skin. He's obviously uh, really trying to do portraiture with flame work glass. Again, quoting Michelangelo here from the uh, Sistine Chapel uh, frescoes where he's painting, uh, here he's working in Marini, in a specific type of Marini. And again, I'm not gonna be focusing on the technical, the technical firepower in this room is huge. I encourage you all to ask Lauren more about his process, but it's unlike the traditional cane bundling that goes on in, in Venice and uh, where they are taking small rods and then just using those rods to fuse them down. Uh, Lauren is flame working and creating similar idea of stretching Marini, but he's actually forming them over a set of stages at the torch where he's building these components. You'll see another example of it here where you're seeing, um, here, here we have uh, Da Vinci, uh, the Madonna, Madonna of the Rocks, uh, Virgin of the Rocks is the original title of the Da Vinci painting. And we have the components on the right where he's got these individual canes that he's then reassembling to create the overall piece. In the traditional cane Marini from Italy, they would have just bundled the individual colors as cane and then stretched them. Here he's actually working intensively each of the components and adding flesh tones and figures and expression a higher degree of control through his pioneering techniques. And I wanted to end with a piece that I know is one of his favorites. It's called Last Stand, 14 inches tall, an interpretation of a Native American scene fighting off a cougar. And uh, the level of detail, I mean, you can zoom in uh, on, you know, just the bead work on the, on the Native American, you know, fabric of the clothing or the lifelike qualities of the horse. This is a nature study. This is a study of life and rendered in a material that nobody really has, has taken to this extreme, uh, the way that, uh, that Lauren has been able to do. I wanna move on to Carmen Lozar's work. Um, this is called Sweet Sleep 2006, flame work glass, mixed media, three and a half inches tall. Uh, Carmen was born in Illinois in 1975. She has an MFA from Alfred University. She's on the faculty of Illinois State University and Illinois Wesleyan University and she was the featured artist in 2006 here at the conference. Um, Carmen's work is fascinating in that she's, she's really got a, a tremendous sense of iconography and of the meaning and tableaus that she creates in these figures with personalities, very strong metaphoric explorations of issues of femininity. Um, we have Girl with Girl Honey. This is a work from 2005, flame work glass as well with mixed media. And uh, the allegorical, and more than that, their figure has some appeal and resonance. There's not an easy allegory here. This isn't Christmas card motifs. They are rich, they have poignancy, they have exploration possible, and you connect with them. There's something in, in, the, in the way that she can present these forms that I think are, are, are very compelling and rich. Um, we have a, a combination here of two works, Early Morning, 2006, on the left, five inches tall. On the right, we have Flutter, 14 inches tall. Uh, I'm not completely clear on the meaning of the early morning. I would assume it has something to do with morning sickness as well as loss and tears coming out. Carmen's work often deals with water and water as a metaphor for grief and for other things. We'll see more of water figuring into her work later. On the right we have flutter which is partly kinetic inside the belly of the woman's, the woman's belly is a, is a butterfly that you can make turn with a little uh, metal uh, rod that comes out the bottom. 
again, we're looking at somebody who's taking a traditional format but taking it in new directions. I haven't seen work quite like this. I think she has her own very highly developed vision that is expressed across all of her work and is continuing to develop in exciting ways. Uh, menagerie, just to show the range of her work, some of these figures appeared in other tableaus and installations. Um, but this is uh, an example, 2006. Uh, the dimensions vary, but you can just get a sense of some more of her aesthetic. It seems it's consistent. There's a really strong Carmen Lozar look to work that I, I, I think is very compelling. And it's very interesting that her most recent work, this is called Separation on the Left, Flamework Glass with Liquid actually inside it, not just water as a motif, but actually water included or some kind of liquid included in the piece. It's uh, 13 and one half inches tall. And on the right, we have Cloud Head, 2009, um, 10 inches tall. And we have really taking it further with water as a clear uh, liquid. We have the droplet forms and then this, this unmatched personality that she can even bring to these figures that are based on water droplets and the dynamics between them. On the left, looks like we have something about separation and like somebody going off to work, maybe a child leaving the home. On the right, we have something called cloud head. Is that something to do with cloudy headed or it's also rain about to fall? I find the work has many layers, both whimsical and I think quite rich and poignant. Finally, to Shane Farrow, who was the 2009 featured artist. Uh, Shane, I remember when we were having the banquet last year, Shane was uh, sending back the wine that was brought because he had his own much higher standards for the wine and they went upstairs to the restaurant and brought him a special bottle of wine. And I, I think that kind of refinement and aesthetic demand is very apparent in Shane's work as well. Uh, birds are one of his motifs that he works repeatedly with. And uh, these are abstractions, as we know from the title here, Blue Abstract Fat Bird. Um, this is something that is from, two, uh, I don't have a year on it, but it's four inches tall. And it re reappears throughout Shane's work. He lives in North Carolina near Penland, and I think the bird, uh, the world of birds there is as rich and varied perhaps as the botanical uh, world that Paul works in. Here we have a more stylized version with uh, brightly colored and designed motifs almost like a Miro uh, painting on some of these incorporated with a vessel. Here he's working with a gaffer. And uh, we have uh, Jade, Moon, Jade Moon Bottle from 2008 and on the left. And on the right we have uh, Najima Bottle, 2008, uh, hot and flamework glass, sandblasted and acid etched. And the, the gaffer on both of these bottles is John Getchi. And uh, they're 22 inches tall on the right, 17 inches tall on the left. Again, we have the stylized bird as messenger, uh, bird as sign and symbol of freedom, um, as well as the great American tradition in Audubon of documenting the world around you and specifically the birds which are so captivating to artists and have been in a long tradition in American art. Um, here we have a botanical dance box from 2008, flamework glass, wood, acrylic paint, mixed media, 12 inches tall. We have him going increasingly, I think, to, uh, toward two-dimensionality or at least to wall pieces. Uh, this is one of several works. I'm going to show another piece that's also on the wall and moving toward almost painting size in terms of the canvas um, as he's doing installations, as we'll see in the next work, Study of the Indian Pipe Family. And this is from 2008. It's flamework glass, black walnut box, acrylic paint, dried specimens, and that's 12 inches tall. And we see a tableau. We see the glass being featured confidently as one material among others in a presentation of something that is uh, meant to be hung on a wall and uh, has a, a botanical quality, also has a timeless age and history quality to it. And uh, we finally, I wanted to include a, picture, a painting, an actual painting of acrylic on canvas that's from this year, uh, 2010, called The Portal. We actually see the bird, I think, to some degree in the, in the little cutouts on the wall, the little figures that we still see on the wall are uh, bird-like. Some of the wings in the doorway are bird-like, but uh, this is a two-dimensional painting. And I, I just like the way that Shane is able to pursue his vision in various means and uh, is not tied and married only to one material, but to the best way to express what it is that he's after. I think this is uh, a wonderful aspect of a, and a sign of confidence. Shane's been working with glass for many years um, he mentions 40 years on his resume, which I find a little hard to believe, but it's possible if he was started very, very young that uh, he could have been working for 40 years, but he has that confidence of somebody who just is using glass to express and clear connection between what he wants and what he's going to end up with. Uh, moving on, that's a student a few years out of uh, Salem, 
uh, just starting to experiment with, uh, with paperweights. And uh, this is a, just shortly after that first one. This is the same student, only a couple years out of Salem. Uh, again, really on this idea of, of, of realizing a botanical paperweight, but still very early in, in the career. I just wanted to show, um, actually it's the earliest works of Paul Stankert. I, and uh, he's probably gonna be angry for me showing them at this <laughs> event, Paul, sorry about that. But I wanted to uh, capture a little bit of the journey that Paul's work represents. This is, this is much more recent work. He's the featured artist this year, and as we know from the earlier remarks, uh, it's a very special occasion for Paul. And um, this is a, a journey that's been, for him, as he mentioned, 40 years. That, that first work was from 1969. The next one was from 1970. This is more recent work where we see the fully realized uh, discovery of Paul of realizing the flower and the floral motif botanicals, incorporating new figures such as honeybees, as well as root systems and stems in these intricate compositions that are highly natural but very stylized in a very subtle and refined way. And I want to talk a little bit about Paul's. Uh, you can just watch the intensity and the high flame that I talked about in the very early part of this talk expressed through the rapid development from that very crude early daisy that he was making with a hand torch to quickly in, 19, in the late 1970s, so this is probably seven or eight years from that first daisy, we're starting to already see branches and leaves and a much more convincing rendition of na the natural world, much more studied, much more closely watched observations of, in this case, dogwood blossoms. Uh, it's still called an experimental piece from the late 70s. It's one and three quarters inches tall. Then we have just two or three more years later, wild allium with seed pod. This is from 1982. It's a three-inch paperweight. But again, we're starting to see new shades of color, fully realizing the, the de delicate stems and, and, and the blossoms. We even see some of the roots beginning to form. Clearly, Paul was devoting a tremendous amount of time to this. This was a difficult period, as he mentions in his life, as he made this transition. I guess at this point, he was starting to get some traction. But uh, pursuing this for years, and making rapid progress, but must have been quite solitary and quite, quite a, a struggle in a lot of ways. Um, to see how far he's come with composition, here's, this is called the Penland Nocturnal Bloom Assemblage, and these are individual elements that he's beginning to put together increasing, with increasing complexity. This was from 1999, and he's made several forms, and he's got the confidence to put them together in a way that makes absolute sense, like the blueberry, the blue of the blueberry is picked up a little bit in the middle piece on the right. There's echoes, there's a visual composition of a painting, and also unique iconography. There's masks in the bottom. There's, uh, we see the, these faces that bring a whole new level of expression, something that Paul has experimented with. We see the orb. He mentioned gold leaf tonight. We see the, glo the globe in the very center, sort of as a metaphysical, undefined metaphysical, powerful image. And again, surrounded by this botanical motif in American art, Nature has been a motivating force for so many artists and so much great work from the Hudson River landscape painters to the Art Nouveau designers and Tiffany windows. It's a great legacy that Paul is bringing into a new material and bringing into a new form and technique and ultimately to new compositions that have, have been readily accepted and, 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 and brought into the mainstream of art. And um, This is a Pineland prickleweed with honeycomb and bees from 2005. One of the interesting things about Paul's work is these are not pure studies. If you were to go out and look for the actual pineland prickleweed, you'd, they may, might exist, but it would probably look a little bit different than this. This is an amalgamation of Paul's ideas and feelings and strong associations with nature and with artwork. And uh, in particular, I think the, the honeybee brings a new level of personality and, and, and energy to his work that is so unique and also so technically demanding. The bee is absolutely right. It could so easily be wrong. It could be flying slightly askew. It could be bent. One of the wings wouldn't look exactly right. And the whole illusion, the whole magic of the piece would be lost. But it isn't. It's exactly right. And if, if it was mistakenly uh, set up, it would never be shown. Paul is that kind of exacting and determined uh, uh, artist who will not let something through that does not meet his standards, his extremely high standards, and his individual pursuit of excellence, which you may have heard if you've heard Paul speak at all about flame working. And I think this is a great encapsulation of all of those things, as well as his color sense and his compositions. In addition, there's something about the bee that's not simply a benign, natural influence, but in fact, there's something dangerous. Bees can sting you. And Paul mentioned to me that actually some of his pieces, which have many bees, people are afraid to